So perhaps you've seen the cartoon of a man who was stranded all alone on a desert island for years. When some rescuers finally arrived, they were amazed to find that he had built three structures. Curious, they asked them what they were for. Oh, the man said, that one there is my home, and that one over there is my church. Well, they said, what's that third one for? Well, he replied defiantly, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> I thought about this cartoon as I read the line in our scripture today where Jesus said, Holy Father, keep them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one just as we are one. And I wondered if what Jesus prayed for, this us being one, is that really possible? I mean, just think about how divided Christianity is. Right now, there are about 2.4 billion Christians in the world, and they can be divided up into three major branches, Catholics, Protestants, and Eastern Orthodox. But that doesn't begin to describe the depth of the division, because each of those branches can then be further divided up into numerous separate and distinct denominations. And amazingly, even those denominations aren't unified because there are denominations within those denominations, each one having their own doctrine and worship style. In my research, I found that Baptists can be divided up into 22 distinct and separate denominational identities. The same goes for the Methodist Church, which, which claims over 30 different branches. Add to that the various Episcopal, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, and Evangelical churches, and you end up with a staggering 200 Protestant denominations in the U.S. alone, and thousands worldwide. It's enough to make your head spin. And in case you think our Catholic Church is immune to this kind of divisiveness, know that there are over 20 denominations in the world that were once Catholic, and continue to call themselves Catholic, but who are no longer in full communion with the Pope. So does all this division break the sacred heart of Jesus? Or could he have meant something different when he prayed for his disciples, and by extension for all of us, to be one? Well, I think something different is going on. Because when you think about it, today's gospel isn't a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Rather, it's a prayer from Jesus to God his Father. It's a prayer that he's letting his disciples overhear. And the fact that Jesus is praying for his disciples rather than talking to them directly is an important distinction. Because it means that Jesus isn't leaving them instructions. He's not telling them to be nice to each other, to get along, to eliminate their differences, to agree on a common plan or purpose. He doesn't demand uniformity, unanimity, or consensus. Instead, what Jesus is praying for is that they can embody a oneness that he hopes will witness to the sacramental presence of God in our world, a oneness that he hopes will carry on the same type of sacramental presence that Jesus so lovingly gave us throughout his life. But what does that mean? What exactly would it take for these thousands of Christian denominations to be one without being locked into some sort of soul-crushing sameness or cookie-cutter worship style? And then, what would it take for that oneness to be sacramental. Well, I think a big clue comes from the fact that when Jesus prayed, he just didn't ask that we be one. Instead, he asked that we may be one as they are one. That phrase, just as we are one, is crucial. It's Trinitarian. It's Jesus recognizing that he, God, and the Holy Spirit, as members of the Trinity, are each unique and that they're not exact replicas of each other, but they are in complete harmony because they're one in purpose, spirit, and love. 
Which means that we can also be one when we're one in purpose, spirit, and love. And how do we do that? By recognizing the sacrificial way that God loves us and then returning that love with humbleness and gratitude. It's our love of God and for each other through Jesus Christ that then would unite us as Christians, no matter our denomination, politics, or nationality. This Trinitarian love then becomes the answer to Jesus' prayer because love is always the greatest common denominator. And that is sacramental because then our lives and our relationships and the love that we express through them become an outward and visible sign of God's inward and invisible presence within each one of us, which is the very definition of a sacrament. Now, I've been leading the RCIA process here at Transfiguration for over 20 years. And I just recently added St. Catherine's to my resume. And every year when people come to our first meeting to explore their interests in converting to the Catholic faith, the first thing I tell them is that I don't care if they become Catholic. And that probably shocks them. Maybe it shocks you too. Until I explain that what I really care about and what I really hope and pray for is that each one of them, through our RCIA process, will grow closer to God. That they'll develop a hunger to want to know, to want to love, to want to serve God better. Because the truth is that Jesus calls each one of us by name, not to establish a relationship with a particular church or denomination, but to establish a loving relationship with Him. And then the important question becomes, which church or which denomination or which faith tradition can best help me or someone on this journey of love? Which one will give us the best tools, the clearest teaching, the most vivid experiences to help our heart grow in and express our love for God? Because at its most basic level, that's what any church should be about helping and supporting one another as we make this very sacred journey to God. Which also means, by the way, that we were never meant to go on this journey alone because God is all about relationships and community. That's what the Trinity teaches us. That's why Jesus picked 12 apostles, not one. That's why Jesus said, whenever two or three gather in my name, I'll be there among them. We all will grow, worship, and love most fully when we're part of a faith community, when we're going to church. And of course, if one of those RCIA candidates decided that another faith tradition or church would best help them do that, I would totally respect that decision. I'd wish them well and more power to them. But I also tell our RCIA candidates that my belief And my bias is that the best spiritual tools can be found through our Catholic faith. That's why I converted. That's why I became a deacon. Because I believe our church, despite her sinfulness and imperfections, provides us with so many profound and beautiful ways to grow closer to God. From her sacred liturgies and prayers, to her beautiful music, from the power of her sacraments, most especially the Eucharist, to her comforting traditions, rituals, and theology. All of these have helped guide me and bring me closer to God. And after all, our church has been doing this for well over 2,000 years now. I think she's getting pretty good at it. Young people, being one in Jesus' love, doesn't mean that we can't have disagreements. The relationship that I have with my brother is a perfect example. My brother is a conservative, Protestant, evangelical Christian who reads the Bible literally 
and trust that it tells him exactly what to believe, even when those beliefs are at odds with modern science. Whereas I am a progressive Catholic who reads the Bible, and particularly the Old Testament, not so much as a history book, but as literature meant to help me better understand how God's love for me and the world should shape my life. Which also means that I don't think science is that in any way at odds with our faith. Because I believe that science is simply another wonderful part of God's creation. But because of our differing beliefs, and because my brother and I love to argue, and because we're both very stubborn, we've had many loud, dragged out, and passionate theological debates about creation, evolution, in science as it relates to the Bible. But even with those intense arguments, at the end of the day, my brother and I still love and respect each other. More importantly, we see each other as brothers in Christ, united in our belief in Jesus as the Son of God and as our Savior. In the most important ways, we are one. It's something, young people, that I wish our world would better recognize and practice, not just religiously, but also socially, culturally, and politically. My brothers and sisters, I believe that this unity that Jesus prays for is a oneness born out of love that is of and from God, which makes total sense because our God is a God of love which means that it's a unity that we can't create or force. It's a unity that we can only participate in through this sacred oneness of God. A oneness that exists at the intersection of our vertical love for God with our horizontal love for each other. And I love that how that vertical love and that horizontal love makes the sign of the cross the very symbol of our Christian identity and a symbol of our oneness. And each time that we authentically enter into this God-entrusted love, boundaries blur, divisions soften, and relationships reconcile. As a wise mystic once said, it's in that moment that we meet the glory of God, and it is us. And if we let it, it's through the grace of this glory that we'll all always be moving towards this very oneness that Jesus prayed for. And I don't think that Jesus could ask anything more of us. Amen.